Blog Talk Radio. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Magic Occult Radio. I am your host, Tally Sid McKnight, and I'm here with the co-host, the Bayou Tiger. And today we are um, today we are joined with a very special guest. Today we have Nick Dutch with us. Um, and today we are discussing summoning spirits or spirit evocation. Um, so today we're going to dive on into, um, I guess you could say, one of the more interesting aspects of ceremonial magic, um, which is summoning demons, summoning spirits and angels, and and this type of thing. So um, you know, when when you when you mention magic, a lot of people think of uh, you know, ancient Hebrew or Latin books for summoning demons or spirits and and things like that. And, uh, you know, I mean, there actually is a lot of uh, occult lore around that, so that's today's subject. Um, So we have our co-host, the Bayou Tiger, and our very special uh, guest, uh, Nick Dutch. Uh, So uh, Nick and uh, Bayou, how are you guys doing today? Absolutely wonderful. It's great to speak to you. And I'm feeling uh, pretty good. It's a good day. That's good. It's great to have you. Um, okay, so uh, Nick Dutch, I see that you have a YouTube channel, um, and you go over lots of different things. Um, you know, you go into vegetarianism, you go into all different aspects of spirituality, and I guess kind of sharing, um, you know, your spiritual journey. Um, but I, I've noticed that you go a lot into spirit summoning, um, working with demons or different entities. So I guess we'll start off with, um, I mean, diving on into the subject of uh, summoning spirits and grimoires. So um, what is, I would say, you said you work more with the Lesser Key of Solomon, or uh, could you explain to everyone... <laughs> Uh, kind of what this means to you of summoning spirits. Like, what does this mean to you? Um, whatever you'd like to say on that. Uh, well, I guess it's the basic 101 of um, spiritualism, struggle cultism anyway, because people who start out on this stuff, they want to try and get some kind of concrete, experiential something or other that will prove to them something. All right, so everyone wants to either see a ghost or see an angel or see a spirit or see a demon, and from that to explore the possibility as to whether some particular beliefs that they have come across at some point in their life may have some validity to them. So for me personally, it was like, um, you know, iron firings to a magnet. I just, bang, you know, I've got to go in that direction no matter what. Uh, And also one of the reasons that I got interested in all this stuff was actually due to an experience I had when, just when I was a little child, about four years of age, and I had a ghost experience. And that the, that was, like, really, really life-changing for me because I had this experience. I mean, you can turn around to me and tell me ghosts aren't real or I don't believe that or whatever, but the fact of the matter is during that time when I had that experience, I had a particular experience of a particular type which is defined in our culture as a ghost experience. All right. Now, it still doesn't prove whether there's life after death or not, but what it does prove is that there's a type of experience which can be had. So I was kind of like going through the period of like exploring why I had that experience, what it actually means, and how that could actually be used when it comes to issues of human understanding, as in what are we, uh, also, possibly, could this be used in a healing way as part of, like, you know, human health or uh, maybe even human communication? That's essentially where I was coming from. So when I kind of, like, hit my teens and I started to get a few more weird experiences, I thought, yeah, I'm going to study this stuff. I'm going to try and find something out. And I got drawn to uh, works such as Transcendental Magic by Eliphaz Levy. Uh, obviously, that's his pen name. His uh, original name was Alphonse Louis Constant. And that sort of like filled my mind with a lot of dogma and doctrine because he wrote in a manner that was trying to create a new culture or a new cult, namely magic, the way he understood it, Uh, which was quite important when we talk about the evolution of different forms of New Age religions, such as uh, neo-paganism, Wicca, and all the rest of that, and even like some of the more left-field stuff, such as like uh, Levain Satanism to a certain extent. 
But what I wasn't really interested in that side of things. That's like one path of um, reasoning or understanding or study or whatever you want to call it, which doesn't quite resonate with me. I'd had right. an experience during a time when I was not part of a witchcraft coven. I was four years old, for crying out loud's sake. I was four years old. Uh, so I wasn't right. part of any religion, all right? I wasn't part of any culture. I hadn't spent ages doing meditation with, like, New Age crystals around my neck and pentagrams in my bedroom or whatever the fuck it was, okay? Uh, but I had this experience, and that showed me that whatever it was that happened to me must have happened to me for uh, a reason of the, of the fact that it is natural. People talk right. about paranormal. Well, yeah, but, but if it happens... It's natural. If I get a headache, it's because of a natural thing. Okay? If I fall down and break my leg, it's because there's physical forces in place which break my leg. <laughs> All right? Right. So if I see, okay. a, if I have something which our culture says is a ghost experience, that is an experience which maybe I can make happen again. That's what's, that's what's so curious. And it's kind of like the promise of the Lesser Key of Solomon, is if you follow uh, certain particular varieties of practice, you may actually get that particular type of experience. So that, that was, I, say, I suppose, the, um, the pull towards ceremonial magic in, in, in a nutshell. Right. Okay. So, I mean, basically, um, you know, working with grimoire, summoning demons, angels, whatever, supernatural entities. I mean, this is, I mean, it is like a science because you're experimenting with the supernatural, okay? And and this is kind of going to the heart of what we would consider an otherworldly or paranormal experience. Um, it's establishing communication with supernatural mm -hmm. entities or, or uh, you know, so, <laughs> I mean... Um, Summoning demons or angels or whatever, uh, establishing contact with an entity and um, doing it in a way that we have experiences, right? Like you mentioned that you have a paranormal experience, you experience a ghost or spirit. Um, so it's basically uh, to summon a spirit and to interact with that. Um, mm -hmm. and, and like we have this literature, we have grimoires. We have textbooks from, you know, the Middle Ages uh, or really from the Renaissance on uh, textbooks on summoning these different types of spirits. So we have the, the Key of Solomon, you know, um, the Ars Galicia, you know, the, the Arbitel of Magic, the Book of Raziel. So we have these different mm -hmm. texts. Um, so just to make sure... I understand what you're saying is, for you, it's kind of like a scientific experiment, right? Uh, for you to try it out and see what experiences you get. Is that basically what you're saying? Uh, yeah, I think that would make a lot of sense. Now, you've used um, a couple of phrases which uh, I thought was quite interesting. The first one is the word science. And I think we need to try and break that down a bit or, treat, or indeed try and think about the context in which we can use that word as opposed to the context in which we can't. Typically speaking, in the natural sciences, the word science means the search for the truth. Okay, and of course there's the methodologies of positivism, anti-positivism, and all the rest of that to try and bring people closer through scientific experimentation with controls and conditions and all the rest of that to try and make the result of uh, coming closer to nature, uh, coming closer to the truth, actually happen. But there's this other meaning of the word science, which is just a body of knowledge. And knowledge itself is often perspective-based. Okay, the knowledge we have today about, let's say, particle physics is different from the knowledge we had 50 years ago about particle physics. So we have to think about when someone has written a book or a, uh, a textbook or a grimoire or a book of religion or spirituality, that represents the place and time of their own personal development of understanding about stuff, okay, at that period in history, at their period in their personal development, okay? And it won't necessarily be something which is fixed. Part of the problem of people who follow grimoires or books on spiritualism or occultism or religion is that they then look back at those things and see those as being the facts, the truth, okay? Whereas they're a stage 
in the progression of understanding as to what the truth might possibly be, which we will come closer to with the passage of time moving into the future. So that's, it, I think it's important to look back at those various different textbooks, and those various different grimoires, because it can give you some fun things to do. Okay, you can follow some of the uh, rituals or meditations or symbols or ideas because, you know, it's fun, it's curious. Uh, some people will go religious about it, and they will try and see, like, the Lesser Key of Solomon or whatever as being the way in which they develop their religion. That's fine. That's up to them, okay? But for me, it's more a question of that is a that is a expression of a period in history. It's like if you were to become an archaeologist, and you find, like, uh, an Iron Age axe, for instance, you know, a little axe head made out of um, rusted iron but it's like an expression of the technology, of the understanding of the time as to what an act should look like, uh, how it should function, how heavy it should be, what it should be used for as opposed to not used for. And so then you can get an understanding of the thinking of the people at the time. So when you get yourself a copy of, let's say, The Lesser Key of Solomon or a book on, by Peter J. Carroll on Chaos Magic, you're looking at a place in time in the history of the author's thinking and also the thinking of the period of the time of the people uh, who are interested in those ideas. Otherwise, the book wouldn't be popular, the Iron Age Acts wouldn't be popular, and so on and so forth. So the, so the different, I guess you're saying, like methods. Okay, like you have uh, many of the classical grimoires um, treat the person that summons demons, for example, sort of like an exorcist. So you can see a very Catholic, mm -hmm. you know, you summon the, the demons, you control them with the names of God, mm -hmm. for example. So that's like filtered mm -hmm. through, I guess you would say, um, a medieval Catholic uh, viewpoint. Whereas, I guess you would say, yeah. you know, if there were a grimoire that survived as uh, ancient Babylonian magic, it would be totally different. So, uh, you know, basically, I think you're saying that... that the different methods are um, more or less just an expression of a place in time and their view of it, right? Um, but I think that probably what many of the, the listeners are wondering, or, um, you know, a lot of people that are hearing about this uh, for the first time, but a lot of people are probably wondering is, okay, so this is great, so there's these ideas of summoning spirit, and then you have an experience, right? But I'm sure a lot of people are wondering, like, how how do you go about it? Okay, say some in spirit, <laughs> how would you do it? And, mm -hmm. you know, I know you say, like, each textbook on magic may have a different perspective, but in your opinion, is there a certain technology behind it? For example, like, withdrawal um, from society, fasting, um, sexual abstinence, uh, prayers. Like, do you feel that there are certain techniques that work that that have that you know are better than others? And what do you think those techniques are? Uh, I mean, just to dive on in, um, what what would you think is a special part of this uh, technology uh, to experiment with calling up spirits? Like, how would you go about it? What do you think is a good method? Okay, well, what I don't think I can give you today is like the IKEA build-it-yourself furniture instructions of how to actually get an experience, which you can do on a rainy Tuesday afternoon when there's nothing on TV, okay? Right. But what I can do is try and give you some perspective, which could possibly be a jumping-off point for people to start doing their own exploration and investigation into trying to generate right. some of these strange experiences. What I've come to the conclusion of, so to speak, is that... It's a combination of temporary suspension of disbelief in a manner that works well with the psychology of the individual at the, at the time, combined with a variety of very slightly altered states of consciousness. All right? It doesn't have so, to be major. It doesn't have to be massive. And if I could just try and yeah. explain that uh, in, a, in a secular way, all right? I mean, let's say there was a, a really, really bad horror film on the Sci-Fi Channel. Uh, you had a day off work, and you watched the Sci-Fi Channel at about 12 o'clock lunchtime, and you thought, God, this is a terrible movie. It's badly edited and all the rest of that. 
fine. Okay, you don't get emotionally involved in it. If you were to then, let's say, have a time when you started a course of education and you spent about 18 hours solidly stu studying, filling your body with tons of caffeine, only eating rice because you can't afford proper food, so your body's malnourished, you haven't taken any vitamin or mineral pills, so you're exhausted because of too much caffeine, you've um, got insomnia, and let's say it's now 3 o'clock in the morning and you think, right, now I'm going to relax and I'm going to watch something on TV, and you turn on the sci-fi channel and it's the same movie. All of a sudden, you're in a state of anxiety, you're, you've got fear, you've got all kinds of things going through you, and you're not really having a pleasant experience. Why is that? It's because your body is depleted and your mind is depleted, and you're therefore more suggestible. So therefore, that's instructed me that suggestion is quite an important thing, as well as an the state of consciousness. Depleting your body and depleting your mind, I don't think is a good idea at all. So it will be going the other way, namely to have a more healthy style of life, so you're, you're clear in your mind, but also you generate a healthy form of altered state of consciousness through the practice of meditation. And then you choose whichever form of religiosity works well with yourself. Now, right. that would depend upon what you personally as an individual accept naturally as making sense to you from a theological or spiritual point of view. In the medieval period, when those grimoires were being written, it would have been like uh, the church, the Catholic church, that was the top authority in terms of science, in terms of um, art, in terms of everything, because everything was under a hegemony of a particular cultural understanding. Okay? So that's why everything would have been taken from a biblical point of view, uh, as if the magician, so to speak, was someone who was following on the work of Jesus Christ and having the power to control and drive out demons, All right, which is, of course, uh, uh, linguistically inaccurate because the word demon, I think it comes from the Greek, and it just means spirit. It doesn't necessarily mean evil spirit or something from hell. But in those medieval times, uh, there was uh, this thinking that either something comes from God and Jesus Christ, or it comes from the devil, and that's it. There was this like, duality of good versus evil, which I think in right. these days, these more spiritual, non-religious days that we're in at the moment, I don't think it's quite that clear-cut. Right. Well, you know, for example, like certain demons, they say, uh, may be just demonization of certain pagan deities. Yeah. Um, you know, such as Belial may come from the deity Bell, or, um, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> or like, um, let's see, like they may say that Astarte, uh, you know, became Astaroth, became this male demon. Mm -hmm. You know, as, as an example, you know, some, there's some theories uh, that that's kind of what happened, is that, you know, these pagan deities were absorbed, they either become saints or demons, um, so, yeah, I mean, that's interesting. Um, but kind of going into, I guess, uh, the technology of it all, um, uh, what, one popular way to look at it, um, is that you have the circle, right? The magic circle protects mm -hmm. the magician. It's a circle around the magician. Um, so like in the Wiccan religion, they cast circles, a lot of people... Uh, you, you know, mm -hmm. the New Age are familiar with matching the ball of life. Not not saying that that's the same thing, you know, take a real New Agey perspective, uh, but just to try to explain it to people that may not know what a circle is. Um, it's mm -hmm. a circle around the magician that protects him, and then there, there's usually a triangle of the arts, um, at which point the magician stands in the circle for protection, and tries to summon the, the demon or spirit into the triangle of the art, right? Like, yeah. we see that in the, the lesser key. And, you know, you have the sigil, the sigil or symbol of the demon or spirit um, is like a magical link with that entity. Um, and, you know, some magicians may burn certain incenses uh, to help manifestation, you know, Dittany of Crete, and some say, well, you should summon the spirit to visible manifestation. Some put like a scrying mirror into the triangle uh, and scry. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, kind of going into that mechanics, um, what have you found 
that works more for you? Like, do you use scrying mirrors, or um, you said you worked with the lesser key of Solomon? So did you? Use well, those, I've I've, uh, I've gained my inspiration, I would say, from the lesser key of Solomon, as in fact the vast majority right. of the New Age world has. If you think about the, the the circle casting in Wicca, that came out of the lesser key of Solomon, which is of course a Judeo-Christian text. So essentially, Wicca is still continuing Judeo-Christian, uh, you know, ceremonies and traditions. If you think about it from a logical and rational point of view, but it's not necessarily a question of you have to do these things in order to get that particular experience. The thing you need to do right. is to, from, from my point of view is to practice things such as meditation and all states of consciousness and do it very gently and, and progress in that direction first and then you're more likely to be able to be tuned in, so to speak, to be able to have a variety of strange experience. Now, all of the theatricals, because, you know, ceremony and ritual is just theatricals. You've just got to accept that, okay? All of the theatricals is part of generating the suspension of disbelief, which you might need to be able to make it more likely that you can have that experience. And it doesn't matter how much in terms of um, prayer and meditation and all the rest of that you've done. You're still going to have plenty of experiences in which nothing actually happens at all, all right? Now, the reason to have your um, sigil or your symbol or your specialist incense is just to connect ideas. It's semantics, all right? So let's say you were to choose, um, I, um, let's say the Archangel Raphael. Okay, you, you, the Archangel Raphael, some people say, is connected to the idea of Mercury. So you find any symbol which is what, what you would regard as being mercurial. The character, the personality, the ideas, and all the rest of that is associated with Mercury. All right, you um, draw the symbol of Mercury, you know, the mercurial astrological symbol on things, if that's the thing which does it for you. Okay? You choose the colors which are right, depending upon the culture which you're a part of, whether it's the more, I don't know, Goetic interpretation or uh, Judeo-Christian interpretation or whichever one reacts well with you. Don't get into debates with the, you know, the, you know, the chaos magician down the road as to what the color yellow means. Work it out for yourself. And then you right. can create an environment in which things seem to resonate in a symbolic way with that character and personality. And that's why you've got your sigil. That's why you've got your incense. And that's why you've got everything else. And all the rest of it, namely the circle and the triangle, that's just stuff which you basically throw in to make things make sense, like components in an electronic circuit are put in place to make electricity move in a certain way. Uh, you're dealing with a, uh, a possible hypothetical spiritual energy which you believe operates in a certain way or you'd like to believe operates in a certain way and that's why you draw your, tri your triangle now to, we're never going to know ever as human right. beings we're never ever 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 going to know whether these spirits these angels these demons the god or whatever exists ever we will never have any hard and fast concrete knowledge of it so to a certain extent we might even be able to say to ourselves hey we're deluding ourselves when we have an experience, we say that this isn't a real experience. There's a possibility of that. It's a small possibility, but it's a possibility. So that's why we have to focus more on the experience and trying to generate that. Now, you don't even have to spend money on your candles and your incense and your oils and your robes and all the um, colored stuff that you want to put all over the place and have the entire place decked out like some kind of like pretentious new age weirdo temple you don't have to do that you can just go into meditation and do it that way and visualize the colors and visualize the symbols and trying to develop a sense of the spirit or angel or spirit or whatever being separate to you as if you're having a conversation with it so it becomes more of a religious experience more than a I command you spirit to do as I tell you kind of thing Right. All right. Well, so, so you, you won't right. know whether this thing is something inside you or something which is outside of you, which you are calling forth. The fact of the matter is you may get the experience, or indeed it may not be necessarily that much of an extreme experience. It may be more, more subtle or psychological, but it can still happen. Right. Okay, I have a question re well, in regards to systems. Like, when whenever you decide to work with the system or kind of experiment with your own, but right before you do the ceremony or the ritual or meditation, what's the mindset that you go in? And how do you mm -hmm. systematically break down or dissect uh, your methodologies and even measure your results? 
Well, firstly, as far as systems is concerned, there's not really such a thing as different systems. I mean, if you were to go to a church and you were to speak to two identical people who've been in the church for the same period of time, they'd have two very different understandings of what, what their religion is about. So essentially, every single system, so to speak, is essentially your own religious interpretation of what you've been coming across. As far as your state of mind, it's, I suppose it's good to do some preparation in advance. You spend a bit of time doing meditation so you're, or training yourself into the right varieties of meditation which you feel may be appropriate for that. So that can be middle pillar exercises, that can be uh, chakra exercises, that can be focusing much more on uh, developing a alpha theta state and you can use binaural beat technology these days to help you do that or you can get yourself a mind machine which can train you in that. And then it's a question of learning how to... Um, <laughs> Do a kind of like mental gymnastics thing to try and f focus your f center of attention on something which is outside of you rather than which is around you the way that you would do when you're normally going through the processes of going down the bank and sorting out your finances and talking to your mother and making lunch. Okay, and then training yourself to feel that particular experience. And then you can then, you know, be more likely to go into your, um, your ritual or meditation or whatever and get something from it. Okay, um, just to let everyone know, um, let's see, it's 9.26. So here in about three and a half minutes, three minutes, um, for those of you that are listening live, um, we're about to go out of the live portion, um, but the full episode will be archived for later viewing um, directly on the Blog Talk Radio link. And also... This will be uploaded to YouTube as well. Um, so um, while the live portion of the show is about to go out, the whole thing will be archived. Okay. Um, okay, and uh, if we could digress for a moment, um, I'd like to kind of break down kind of, I guess, how I personally, if I could, like, in my personal view, like simplify the basic procedure and what it is, um, I like what you're saying that, you know, there are just, there are no different systems, just different perspectives, right? Because, yeah, mm -hmm. totally different systems, and they both work, supposedly. Um, but this is how I personally see it, okay? You're trying to contact an entity. It could be a demon, a god, uh, you know, an angel, whatever. You want to contact... Um, a specific entity. So, first of all, I do think that the circle and the triangle are helpful. Um, the circle is a protective measure, and this is where you are, and the triangle says the spirit is here. So, I mean, it, it kind of, the, the triangle kind of shows you where to look. You know, it's like a center of focus. Um, so, I think that the circle and the triangle of the art like you find in the R. Scalicia is very useful for this. Um, you know, some people may have scrying mirrors to look in to kind of help them to see the entity. Um, but basically, okay, um, just to share different perspectives, this is how I see contact spirit is to have, to build a link, the magical link, um, establishes a connection with an entity, or so the theory goes. So get the colors, incenses, metals, symbols, the name, as many things that resonate at that frequency or represent that entity. These things, um, I don't know if, you know, some people may think that they really help explain. Some people may say it's all in your head symbolically. But the theory is this establishes a link. So you have the spirit sigil during, you know, you could say the planetary day and hour, the proper colors, incenses, things like that. And this kind of builds a connection. That's how I see it. It's like the magical link. You know, it's like a personal telephone number. So to call it the spirit of Mars, you know, you may work on Tuesday, the hour of Mars. Not to be limited in that system, but, you know, it's, it does seem to help, like a personal telephone number, you know. What do you think about that? That's how I see it. 
it helps us to I think what you yeah I think what you've done though is you've just expressed in uh, different words and from a slightly different perspective basically what I've just said um, but yeah. I, I think that what you've done is you've explained it probably a little more from a religious point of view rather than an, an experimental point of view. But as an explanation, I'm pretty sure it goes. But I, I don't think it's a question of there's any particular theories uh, which state that you have to do this, that, and the other. I mean, if you look at what the chaos magicians do, they just um, create something which looks like a very messy squiggle which they've created. Uh, which they believe has some kind of connection to a spirit or an angel or a demon or whatever it is they want to call it. And um, and they use that to try and either do spirit communication or something which seems like a spirit communication or to try and create an apparent change in the outer world. Uh, of course, the key word there is, of course, apparent because there's so much in the, in the world that we don't actually know. But, yeah, right. it is a question of a symbol or a symbolic structure which has that kind of... Um, symbolic connection to what it is you're trying to achieve but it is symbolic uh, and therefore it's you know if you personally need to have a bit of copper piping lying around on your table when you're trying to do something venusuvial then you know go for it i personally wouldn't i would probably just um sit back relax visualize the color green an awful lot, shove the symbol of uh, Venus in it, try and conjure up ideas and thoughts and feelings and emotions and sensations in my mind's eye of things connected to uh, femininity or nature and other sort of like very Venusuvial things, try and generate the right. emotion of love in my heart chakra or whatever it is, and then just like embrace it. Right. Okay. Um, in the Vayu, um I mentioned this earlier that uh, at some point in the show, I kind of wanted to go into um, your, uh, you working through the Abra Melon working. So, mm-hmm. um, Bayou Tiger, do you mind delving kind of into that process or your experience? Yeah, or I whatever can fill them into it. The thing about uh, the book of Abra Melon is like, it, it's a, it's, what I would call an anti grimoire sort of sort of grimoire. What it does is it takes the Jewish faith, but it essentially says you can do magic anywhere at any time. And that's what defines true magic. Which I find interesting because this wipes out um many of the semantics that you find in the uh, Kia Solomon as an example and even some of the more well-known grimoires like the uh, grimoire of Arthur Gauntlet and, and such. But it's actually a lot more practical in a sense. Uh, you have you have so many squares, and in these squares there are actually names of demons. But unfortunately, Mathers really uh, got the worst translation possible, and he kind of added in some conjecture with his own material in there, but uh, the best known source, or uh, what I consider the best source for the Book of Abermelon, uh, is actually by George Den. And what it is, it's it's about this rabbi who travels, and he's from Worms, and, and he was born around the time where there was a plague that was wiping out the Jews right around Germany. And um, apparently uh, he learned his magic from the mage. And what's interesting is he was given several pieces of gold and he he gave it to 72 people around Iraqi, which was a town around um, the area. But, it, but it's really practical. It's pretty much based on squares. It's based on um, like biblical instructions. Uh, you have your Abermelon oil, which is actually identical out of the Bible. And there's also the aspect of using simple lines out of the Tanakh or the Bible to to cast spells. You you have your beeswax, then you also have your strict diet as well. Uh, Back then, you mainly just ate a lot of bread, which which isn't quite healthy, but um, so I kind of tailored that up a little bit. But the thing is, you have to remember that it, to do something like that out of a book directly is written back in the 1400s. I mean, yeah. that it's almost impossible because 
many of the herbs that were around then aren't even around now. I wouldn't even say many of them, but some of them. Uh, and then also, living off bread in modern times is silly. Uh, so you kind of have to uh, devise a little bit of something that works. I mean, it's actually very, very practical. He said he used this magic for kings and queens and royals and rich people and charlatans and all that good stuff. So well, it's, it's like really Alistair practical Crowley, but really complex. Yeah, well, Aleister Crowley, you know, attempted the Aubrey Mellon working, and, you know, that's why he purchased the Boleskin house, <laughs> you know. And uh, really this whole idea, the, the Aubrey Mellon grimoire gives uh, – that's where the Golden Dawn and Aleister Crowley get the term the Holy Guardian Angel in gaining knowledge and conversation of your Holy Guardian Angel, um, which is the Opera Melon working. So basically, in the Opera Melon um, operation, you know, you enter the period of fasting and purification and all of that, you know, and then you summon up... Uh, the dukes or the princes of hell <laughs> after you after you have knowledge and conversation with your holy guardian angel then you summon up these demons and uh, bind them to your will essentially and then you work with the magic square is that right I mean uh, would you like to share a little bit about the process so you went through the um, whole process yeah I mean you pretty much it, it's the same process like as in the key of Solomon for example but you're not dealing with squares and you're, and you're not dealing with circles the, the author just quite simply thought, I can call this demon, and I'm going to do it. I mean, um, it really, the, that's what really separates it from most grimoires. It's a little bit more technical uh, in numerology and, mm-hmm. and gematria, but but the process is, is unique. And, and the mainly the process is unique because um, he's talking about Iraqi, which is, which is fascinating. And Iraqi, which is... It's it's a village that still exists today. It's speculation whether it's uh, the, the still the actual village, and and it's found right along the Nile, which is interesting because it's not far from Nag Hammadi, which is where we found the Nag Hammadi scriptures. And some of the book has some agnostic vibes to it because it, it's from Quen, the the Quen province of Egypt. So and at that time, Gnosticism. Yeah, Gnosticism was very, very big around that area, especially during the 1400s on up until the uh, Catholics went and invaded and destroyed uh, much of the remnants. But, yeah, it's the same basic concept, but without a lot of the semantics, but with more biblical semantics. Yeah. If that makes any sense. Very Mm -hmm. cool. Oh, in uh, Nick Dutch... uh I think you said something you wanted to share an experience that you had. You said the angel of death or something. Would you would you like to share that, you know, before we close? Yeah, sure, absolutely. That was a weird one. I did that when I was in my teens, uh and I obviously I'm forty years old now, so it was quite a while ago. But I was uh I was going through this period of like uh, anxiety and neurosis and all the rest of that and I thought, What the hell, I'm gonna I'm gonna do a ritual. So I set up like an altar space uh, using the colors white and blue to try and give myself this uh, illusion or feeling of protection. And I used the sigil of um, Saturn, and I chose to try and summon the Archangel Cassiel using the number square of Saturn as well. And, you know, I did the whole thing, you know, can- candles at the quarters. I had a circle of evocation and all the rest of that. I had the triangle set up, and it was all pretty cool. And I did my ritual, and it was very close to bedtime, and hey, presto, nothing happened. So blew out all my candles, opened the window, got the incense out, you know, all that <laughs> terrible smoke, uh, closed the window, and just prepared for bed. And I lay in bed feeling, you know, racked with all kinds of adolescent anxieties you do in your, you know, late teenagers or early 20s. And I thought to myself, why must I suffer? Because I was thinking of the pain and the anxiety I had. And it felt like I was screaming it, not only into the pillow, but also into the center of the room where I did the circle casting. And I felt this thing, a bit like a bolt of static electricity coming back from the center of the circle to my own head. Okay, just like going straight into me. And it seemed like that bolt of static electricity seemed to carry words. 
and the words, which obviously weren't uttered using the vibration of the air, but was through like the carrying of a meaning from a place to my head, said, because you chose it. Now that was weird, but that, it didn't stop there. Because as I lay in bed, I turned over onto my left-hand side and started moving into that state of mind between waking and sleeping, as you do when you're drifting off to sleep. I felt this um, bubbly electric sensation on my shoulder and on my hip. And I kind of like turned round and looked up. And I saw this thing made out of, um, I don't know, black and red sparkles. And it was in the shape of a fully anatomically correct skeleton with one of its hands on my hip and the other one on my shoulder. And whatever this thing was, it gave off an aura of warmth and wisdom and compassion. And then it dissolved away. Now, that was freaky. But that happened. Wow. I guess, uh, you know, the skeleton uh, gives us the image of Saturn. You know, he said it was... The angel Cassio, the angel of death. But it didn't give you, like, a freaky or negative vibe. You said it seemed uh, compassionate and wise. Compassionate, caring, warm, loving, almost pitying to a certain extent. Wow. That's amazing. Beautiful. How far were, were you One of those your experiences when, that makes you kind of, like, it, open up and start to think more about, like, you know, we're all part of something bigger. Right. Was this yeah. like early on when you was uh, working in, in in your occult uh, studies and practices? Yeah, or a little bit later. Uh, still relatively early. I mean, none of this. Uh, you, you don't stop learning. You don't stop experiencing. You don't stop growing. You don't stop practicing. Mm-hmm. And I mean, those. Uh, I mean, I could give you loads more experiences. There was one time when I was trying to improve my visualization skills. And I tried to visualize a five-pointed star made out of rays of light drawn on my face. Uh, and I, for some reason, I couldn't get two of the points done properly. Then I got on my little moped and went to see a friend of mine who unfortunately had a, a mild psychotic problem. He was on uh, dopamine uh, to help him with his brain problem. And when I went um, to his house, uh, one of the first things he said to me when I put my head around round the door is, I can see three points of a five-pointed star on your face. And he had no knowledge at all that I was doing that particular meditation. Yeah. That is interesting. But he could could see it. Now, these things happen. (laughs) These things happen. And it's weird and it's freaky and but it's but if it does happen then it must be natural. It's this is the natural world we're dealing with. And it's very, very strange. But it's part of nature. I agree. That, um, that's true. You know, and I've also had like very <laughs> freaky experiences like that as well. Um, and I agree with you. Like to me personally, I do see it in a sense as a an experimentation of science. You know, we have these experiences. Maybe that's not like proof or evidence that. We do have the experiences, and we can generate these experiences. And, you know, when you have a really profound experience like that, or especially when you have several or many, (laughs) you know, especially when it's by going by certain processes or, like, I mean, if you go through the methods to try to have an experience and then, boom, it happens, you know, it's, it's sort of like a technology And whether that's real out there, like these are real spirits, or even if they are just aspects of your mind, you know, this is the type of uh, technology. That's how I Mm -hmm. see it. I mean, mean, for me me personally, it just makes me believe that we're we're all somehow interconnected. Uh, All the people you know that you love. Um, you're connected to them somehow. All the people that you know that you hate and you can't get on with, you're still connected to them somehow. And it's like Absolutely. everything in the world is trying to go through the process of growth and healing somehow. And that's just the way it seems like it could hypothetically be, but that's still hypothetical. And But that's these experiences make me think that, you know? Right. Oh, wow. 
Well, hey, um, it looks like the show's about to cut off. Nick, Mm -hmm. man, I've really enjoyed having you on the show, and I've really enjoyed it, and I'd like to really, you know, have you back. You know, it was was really an honor. I've really enjoyed it. Yeah, sure. Not a problem. Anytime, man. Yeah. So it looks like we're about to cut off. Um, 